Hello, everyone. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us. My name is Vanessa Langhurst. I'm the Supervisor of Circulation and Multimedia here at the Columbus State Community College Library. We have some wonderful presenters today who are part of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Speaker Series. This is, in support, this is supported by the State Library of Ohio with federal funds from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Kind of just want to let everyone know how the flow of this hour is going to go today. So I'll introduce Kathy and she'll share some of her poetry with us. Then we'll have a mini discussion on grief and loss and we'll open it up for questions. Um, we will be muting microphones, but feel free to enter questions into the chat at any time. Then Kathy will give us a writing prompt. I'll introduce Sarah, who will lead us into meditation. A lot of the things we're talking about today are heavy um, and we want everyone to kind of hold space and feel these emotions um, and sit with them during the meditation before we rush back into work in our busy lives. So I am pleased to introduce Kathy Zhang, Kathy is the author of the full-length poetry collection, Poor Anima, and three chapbooks, Ode to the Far Shore, Dear Hour, and Elegies. Her honors include Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosen <laughs> Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation, Residencies at McDowell, a Vermont Studio Center Fellowship from the Ohio Arts Council, at the Ohio Arts Council and two Individual Excellence Awards also from the Ohio Arts Council. Her work has been featured in the following publications, Poetry, The New York Times, Poetry Society of America, and the Academy of American Poets websites. In 2018, her poem on visiting the Franklin Park Conservatory and Botanical Gardens was highlighted in an immersive poetry installation at the Poetry Foundation Gallery in Chicago, a collaboration between the Poetry Foundation and the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, centering on the conversation of grief and loss. In 2019, she was awarded Best of Net for her poem, Year of the Cardinal Song. She is the Spring 2022 Artist in Residence at the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU. We have put links in the chat to her website and her spring residency installation. Currently, Kathy is working on her second poetry collection, which examines the entanglement of her mother's violent death, the grief that comes with being a child of war refugees, and the impact of intergenerational trauma and how it's had on her as among American poet and researcher. This body of grief work is an ode to the inability to return home as a descendant of illiterate diasporans, interrogating as well as creating myths around mothers, death, and gardens. Kathy. Thank you so much for the introduction, Vanessa, and thank you to all for joining us today. Thank you to CSCC Library for, for hosting and for uh, Sarah Eastbeck for joining us later uh, after the event here. Just want to, I just wanted to begin with uh, three poems from my first book, Poor Anima, and then I will be moving towards uh, three newer pieces that I've been working on for my second collection. Uh, this first poem in Poor Anima is called Casualties. And in this collection, there are a lot of poems that discuss more or less my, my anxiety about being Hmong and being Hmong American and grappling with my parents and their lack of, their lack of of an outlet to think about how their traumas and sorrows in their lives have impacted them. And so a lot of these poems really are me just exploring, thinking about my place in them. And this one is for my parents. Casualties. The remains of a refugee half tucked in earth, an arm stretched, a chicken's claw clasped in hand, Plumes of white hang over, keep the dead decent. A foot and three toes remain in the open. One nail flared, the underside of thorn red youth. An absent face peering from the depths. A dog licking the tit of an upturned woman. Drops of rain pushing out the first worm. This second poem is called Childhood. And it's kind of a collage 
you could say of my experiences when I think of my childhood and the things that stood out to me when I was thinking very much about my parents and again their their stories and our family's history and again where I fit in all of that because I was born and raised in Fresno, California so I can't possibly pretend to know at all the life that the lives my parents led and they had when they were in Laos before, during, and after the Vietnam War. And so this poem is kind of a, an ode to what I do remember of my childhood. And it wasn't exactly a very happy childhood. So um, this poem is, is, is dedicated to that childhood. Salt, dust, bright life, sudden peach, wet meat, brown seeds, buttonweed, rooster pen, pulled skin and papers with pictures, hands washed in rain, a little sun for a bit of bleach, a little sun for taste, please. Morning again to the bumblebees and loquat tree, toasting leaves and re-seeing old seasons and facing the different corners of the yard. This last poem is for my mom. This book was written before my mother passed away, but there are a lot of poems in here that really feel like they were pre-grieving her, her death later in life. And so it feels haunting for me to revisit some of these poems because it often feels like I'm not ready and ready to face the poems and ready to remember the truth that she's no longer here. Dear mother, the ear has listened. Be still, rinse out, say the path is ruined. In death, we do not know, form the private sound, the human bird transient, empty in iron. The bird, a resilient shape bent in surrender, a design to the nature of remains, the things named or in question, fixing the word, a reset in different, in broken bones, gems, a mechanical device, again differently. This time, a depression, etc. I hand over my species because we do not migrate. It is complicated. They are always after it. My shape resumes to a former me, narrow in a process that repeats. The recession of the sea makes a scene for time and peace. The this becomes these. Such are human affairs, unseen, the most familiar type of crises, freezing point, a book for spreading. These next three poems are from my current collection in progress. This one is called On Praising the Liver. In the Hmong culture, I suppose one thing you could know about the poem, but also in general, is that the liver is regarded as a very important organ. It's actually referred to as the heart in, in my culture. And so the liver is above the heart in terms of importance. And so the liver then is the seat of emotion and, and feeling. And so that's why the liver makes an appearance in here. Um, my mother, just for a little bit of more context, my mother died in a car crash in 2016 and her death was a very unexpected passing. And I've been thinking very much about that and how that's affected me and my understanding of my own body and hers. My mother was a shaman and she was a medicine woman. So I think very much about the body at all times. And I think very much about the spirit. Even though I grew up fairly agnostic, I wanna say um, shamanism and animism are very present in my 
refugee immigrant household. So while those things were constantly around me, I, I grew up agnostic, but it was when my mother died when I realized how much all that knowledge that she had, um, she didn't just perish away, but her knowledge as well and the memories she had and she carried. So I've been grieving that and thinking very much about the seat of emotion, the liver, what that means on praising the liver. One more context is that um, some of these poems are, they're based off of a lot of dreams I've also had within the first few years of her passing on praising the liver. I dip my mother's ribs in the delicious water. The perils of this translation lost in the mountains I crossed to get here. Joined by herds of saula swelling through the forest. Overhead, a drowsy river of hawks sweeping in for the open burial. As if caught in a bad story, I befriend the renegade whose shadow belongs to me and to the monkeys who've come out to take over this joyous path. They descend slowly into the springs, floating on their backs, forming a ring around the stone-prized liver. I welcome them and assign us names to protect the colony we have created from my divided grief. Then I wade into the bath, this time with mother's arms, and we hold each other tightly, hiding deep in the steam. I look onto the map of her darkening liver to find the end times blurring hastily into honey, the holes in our eyes sealing up and our mouths opening to drink our sweet luck, my thigh aching for a stretch, my heel snipped, the saula performing migration in loose script. Among the tired trees, red-bellied squirrels squirming in their nests, midday songs coming over the crest, and for a moment the air suspending me, sowing unto mother's ear the night of our lives, the winged lords laughing at us from a distance. We could rule like this, merciful mother with ancient stamina lathering the side of her crown, black, starry, melodious, green. This one is called Among the Golden Rods. In array, the omen, hedged with cardinal flowers, the wild garden consulting with a hair trap, the field stretched and buried with deer droppings, some remorse laid by limbs long gone, penumbral, felled arms of golden rods gathering in this wake, the lineal dream, broken galls, parochial, ring-necked pheasants sinking in the open country, oaks with sunlight slipping tongue for tongue, a clearing marked in the crop of a chickadee. I pass, keep passing, some cause learned enough to send for the sun immobile from the edge of winter. Love seething in grounds before me. The wind in a bow above the black crown cutting back to kiss me. The long death making pact with palms of flowers. Mother's dead eye once more frothing with nectar. My hair birthing into serpents. This very spring returning to me, the idyllic ruin so watery, I must forgive the shores gathering at my feet. The beginnings of raised, of earth raised in hills of fire. The perennial hour of hurried geese sliding storms to cry home. O oh, wanton mother, blade at the heel, come forth. At the mark of the hedgerow I cut, Make game of my neck, make scar of the cardinal flower, the sky mute upon the tides, five suns budding inside my form. 
such illumination, moons unwilling, mother's fingers mangled in metal emerging from the stars. This last poem is called After Eden and it was written during my trip while in New York City while attending my spring residency. After Eden. Wherein I loan myself a line to break from afar. The lamentation stuns in frame. Fevered and lawless, my home seemingly overgrown without me. The yard gravely mistaken for sanctuary. The imperfect memory succeeding. Such delirium even I cannot begin to note why the sky turns away from me sunlight unable to land or prolong a battering thought. In my dullness, I stand in the grass, webs assailing boughs, blood storming behind my eyes, with my hands strangling a strange thing, possibly in a dream. The day before, my mother rupturing from root, the reanimation unable to leave behind the sedges of a distant life, flowers beside themselves with the nominate language. I would have asked of the dark to shield us from harm, but her voice was bright, my heart unyielding. How is it possible? Yet I don't mind how it sounds, the barrenness above forgiveness, death unadorned, pheasant's eye springing forth, and upon my honor, small insects abound and in dying. Thank you. Wow, I think I speak for everyone when I say wow. Thank you so much for sharing your words with us. Um, yes, that was, that was beautiful. Um, so have you always expressed yourself through poetry? Is this something you started later in life or give us a little insight on that? Yes, yeah, so I started writing poetry really seriously when I was in high school, but I would say even before I pursued the act of writing, poetry has always been very present in my life. My, my mothers and my father, they are, they are wordsmiths and, and of their own, and they, so in my culture, uh, song poetry is a very embraced and beautiful art form in which someone uh, sings their songs and, and their songs, th these are life ballads, um, more or less. And it also requires the very strong ability to speak the language. And so of course my parents, um, they could speak the Hmong language very well and, and they could sing. And, and uh, there are these rules. Um, it, there's a lot of rhyme and there's a lot of meter and uh, needless to say, I never really caught on. My, my mother's tried to teach me when I was younger, but I just, it was so awkward in the Hmong language, even for me, felt so difficult to, to hold as if it were my language. It's always felt like my parents' language. And perhaps that's because I was born and raised in California and in the United States. And so English, uh, even though it's my second language, I eventually adopted the English language to become my more dominant language in both reading and writing and speaking and so even when I was much younger my parents always wanted to try to gift this ability um, and and because I couldn't do it I decided to uh, pursue it more seriously when I was in high school um, it occurred to me at that point by the time I reached high school I, I was so I think I was so very overwhelmed with the experiences and with the grief that my parents um, held in their bodies and, and they came here as refugees from Laos and there are very many of us in my family I'm on the younger side but needless to say I had this kind of this burning desire to want to write my own and to chart my own songs if I couldn't sing them the way my parents wanted me to or or had hoped that I could I thought you know I think I'll try writing. And it actually was because of my ninth grade English teacher at the time who recognized that I had, I had a lot to say. And so she was the one who really encouraged me to write. And 
and um and I haven't stopped writing since wow teachers give it for teachers <laughs> that's lovely um you mentioned a little bit about um your residency at NYU um and I looked into it a little bit in your grief garden. So if we could talk about that for a bit um, and just how, how you came up with the idea um, for this immersive interpretation um, from one of your poems. Sure, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I am currently the spring 2022 artist in residence at NYU, at the APA Institute, the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU. And so my garden, my grief garden installation there is, kind of a resurrection of my first grief garden. It wasn't called grief garden at the time, but it was simply an, a poetry installation that was, that had taken place in, in 2018 in Chicago, the Poetry Foundation and the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. They collaborated and um, highlighting this poem, but also really the, the highlight of that poem was to invite the public to come into this space and to think and to meditate about loss and grief and what that has meant to them. Because often it feels very difficult to ask for that space, mm -hmm. especially in institutions and in academic institutions to be, to ask permission to be vulnerable is a strange position that I feel we're constantly in, even today, even in this pandemic. And so the first iteration of the grief garden was in 2018, but then when the pandemic, actually right before the pandemic came, I had been planning with APA at NYU, uh, a second version of it. Um, I was actually just a, a guest who was supposed to come in on behalf of the artists and residents at the time, Ocean Vong. Uh, they were there and they were putting together this project called the Center for Refugee Poetics and it was a beautiful and amazing concept and idea and and so I was invited to be a part of the panel and to present uh, this grief garden and then 2020 came everything got cancelled so fast forward a year later in 2021 APA they reached out to me and said you know hi Kathy how would you feel about coming back as the spring artist uh, and you know, leading your residency with the garden. And I thought, oh, wow. Um, so I, you know, I said yes. And so it's it's been an experience. They've been amazing. I love them very much. And the garden, so the grief garden, what is it basically? It's, again, it's no different from its mission from the first one, which is that it's it's meant to be a space for individuals to come in, to not only just read the poem and to immerse themselves in the atmosphere of, of, the, of the space, but to read the poem, but, but to, to think and to meditate about how grief has impacted their lives. And, and if they so wish, they can write a letter to anyone, a lost loved one, but also a living person if they wish. Um, they'll write it on these paper plant templates that I've had artists design for me, Nathan Kamenishi and Megan Lau, they both have been so amazing. Um, you'll write a letter to a lost loved one, you'll tie it onto a garden trellis that's part of the installation and the, the, at the installation the trellises were designed by uh, Idra Soto um, and they were originally designed for the Poetry Foundation and um, Smithsonian APAC project but we were reusing them in the current iteration at NYU. So it's a, it's a multi collaboration between three institutions but so yes, you come in, you, you read the poem, or you meditate about what grief has meant to you. You write a letter, and you contribute that letter by tying it onto one of the garden trellises, and it's meant to hang there openly for anyone really to read. But So it's both a private and a public act of communing with yourself, but with others. And uh, so that, that's the grief garden, and it's it really has been a surreal experience because it, it you know, the, the whole project started from a very personal trauma in my life and then was scaled into something that was so much more public and bigger than me because so many people have lost loved ones, but have never really had the space, time, and energy, or even language to, to talk about that. That's lovely that you gave them a space for that. So that'd be great. Um, so it's often hard for people to really, you know, understand and express concerning um, their grief and their loss. And how how do you tap into those feelings and put them onto paper? 
Yeah, that's a great question because everybody hurts and feels differentially and, you know, so pain and grief. Um, many of us are, are lucky to have people who are vulnerable, who have demonstrated what vulnerability looks like. And so for some of us who have lucky been, to have witnessed that, it, it, it lends itself easy, uh, it, I, I guess, for me anyway, when I approach the page. Um, but for some of us who weren't as lucky, where parents, um, say, or family members withheld a lot of difficult uh, subject matters and feelings of, about grief and loss, many of us have had to come into our own and, and realizing and learning what that's like for us. And so how I approach the page, it's, and how I, how I tap into that, um, I think it really is thanks to my parents. It, it, it's a very strange relationship. It's very bittersweet because, you know, my parents have always had a difficult time trying to hold their sorrows and um, to think about all the death and loss during, before and after the war and, and their time assimilating in this country. There, there's been a lot of grief all around. And I got to witness that firsthand. And, you know, my parents often really trying to make ends meet. That was not very, it was very ugly at times. It was very difficult. And being one of their very many children, I got to, I got to witness a lot is, is all I, I could say. And so I felt like I took a lot of notes in my own mind and, and thinking about how you know, ironically, expressing your emotions openly like this is not really something that happens in a Hmong family. Um, and every Hmong family is different. But um, so it, it's, it's one thing, uh, being vulnerable is, is okay. But when, you, but when you take too much time to be vulnerable, suddenly it, it, it's, uh, it's taboo. And um, so there's a lot of complex feelings around expressing yourself and needless to say I I found it easy to to just to do just that and and so for me even if I write about really difficult subjects I it's I, I don't know how to explain it. It, it I suppose it's like I don't really have to think about breathing it just happens and so writing and tapping into very difficult feelings and writing about them is just like breathing Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Nathan, do we have any questions in the chat? We did get one question in the chat from Dana, who asks, um, how long do you work on a piece before you feel it is complete? Thank you so much for that question, Dana. Well, I, you know, it's, I think poems are very funny in that often you may think they're done, and then sometimes they're not, but how to decide when something is done. I think for me, how to decide when a, a piece is complete, I think as if when I've entered the poem, um, where and you know where it leads me, do I feel like I've come to a portal that opens into the next, which is another poem. Um, it, it's a little vague and abstract to say that, but I think that when the poem has led me to another door um, after a series of doors, but this door feels like a, a kind of final door where the realm of that poem is, is, is done presenting itself to me. I think that's when I, I feel that the poem is complete. But even then, I, I, it's funny that I say that too, because I, I am a, I over edit, I over revise, I heavily revise all the time. It's just the writer in me. And I never feel like what I say is the final say. And so it can be endless. It can be several years, I think before I feel like a piece is finished. But sometimes there are really just short moments where that's what a poem is sometimes for me. It's just a short moment capturing this time and this place. And um, whether it's just a few lines long or maybe a little longer, um, yeah, it, it, that would be entirely up to you how you define what, how you define what is complete. But yeah, for me, I think whenever I feel the poem is, is done, um, showing me what it wants to show, then, then that's when I decide it's done. Great, thank you. So would you like to close out your session um, with a writing prompt? 
Yeah, so let me go ahead and just copy and paste this into the chat as well for everyone to see. Thank you. Um, so the question here, um, just a bit of context is if, if we can allow ourselves to truly feel, to feel in our unwellness, um, quoting from Dr. Mimi Kuku, my adore and completely love their their whole teaching is about this pedagogy of unwellness how to allow ourselves to be down when we need to feel down and to really feel in that because it's so important um because otherwise to always be well productive and happy is, is, is a very ableist thinking and concept that it's not very possible for many of us so and, and if we could allow ourselves to fully embrace um you know, just, just to feel vulnerable, to be vulnerable. Um, my question is something that for those in the audience to take away from this and, and for those who, you know, whether you're writers or not, um, it, it's a, I'd like to think it's, it's an important exercise for us to attempt at least once. And uh, so my, my, I guess my challenge and my question to everyone here is, uh, what does grief look like to you? What does grief look like? You could start by writing down a list of objects places and or names of people. Uh, challenges may arise as you meditate on what each of these entries mean to you and give yourself permission to explore their significance. See where they might lead into the creation of a poem or a piece of artwork. So that's my, that's my prompt. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, this was lovely. Um, and then Kathy will um, be around at the end of Sarah's notations so of people kind of um, marinate on these and have some more questions. Um, we'll have questions for Kathy and Sarah at the end. So um, I'm going to now introduce Sarah E. Speck. Uh, Sarah is a 200 hour registered yoga teacher with a passion for teaching meditation. She also teaches stand up paddleboard yogas in the summer. Her mission is to help students out of their minds and into their bodies with movement and stillness. I actually had the privilege of attending one of Sarah's classes here at Columbus State, um, where she spoke on trauma sensitive yoga and a movement for mindfulness to allow the breath and body to settle. Today, she will hold space for emotions to be felt, starting with a three part breath, and we will be uploading the script into the chat as well. Sarah, take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction. Kathy, thank you so much for sharing. That was I want to say beautiful, also heavy at the same time in a way that feels so authentic and real. And to be able to share that, what you said about vulnerability will really stick with me. So thank you. So a little bit about our structure for today's meditation. We'll be beginning, we will be beginning with a three-part breath. And if any of the breath practice that we do today becomes uncomfortable at any point, if you get to a point where you do not feel like it's serving you, just release it, come back to a natural breath. Um, as we go through a little bit of meditation after that, I typically like to begin with physical sensations in the body. So we'll be juxtaposing two physical sensations, heat and cold. And as you begin to manifest these sensations, as we get into this, it doesn't have to be entirely real. Just think about these sensations in your mind. We'll be going through more mental sensations, some spiritual, emotional, and then we'll finish with more physical sensations just to round everything else and bring us back to the present moment. Um, so we'll begin. I invite you to start in a comfortable seat. If this comfortable seat means rearranging a bit, if you need a few moments to take time to begin to find where the hip points sit in your chair. If it's comfortable for you to place your feet on the ground, feel free to do that. And as you get settled and comfortable, take a few moments to orient yourself with the space. Notice the sensations around you. Notice the noises that you're hearing. Maybe you begin to notice the very closest sound you can hear. Maybe you begin to notice the very furthest away sound that you can hear. But as we begin, very gently, we'll start with noticing the natural breath. Inhaling through the nose. Exhaling through the mouth. And very easily, sometimes a shift happens automatically. When we begin to notice the breath, the breath may deepen. The breath may become just a bit deeper, more rich. We might feel a lengthening of the inhalation or a lengthening of the exhalation. Sometimes you may notice a deepening of the inhalation or a deepening of the exhalation. 
But whatever is here for you, take a moment to notice the sensations that are already present in the body. This could be noticing how the brain is feeling. This could be noticing how the body is feeling. Do we feel tired? Do we feel more energetic? Just take a moment to scan the body and notice what's here. Our goal today is not to suppress any emotions. Our goal is just to feel what comes up, breathe with it and let it go. So if at any point, anything comes up that feels a little bit too big to hold, come back to your natural breath, come back to the room. All right, we'll begin either energetically or physically with your hands. We'll begin to place the hands on the low belly. And if it's not comfortable to place the hands on the low belly, just feel free to use the mind's eye and mentally imagine them there. As you inhale, feel your low belly rise and fill with air. As you exhale, feel the low belly fall. Inhaling into the sensation of expansion and exhaling into this feeling of release. As we inhale, we expand, we get just a bit bigger. And as we exhale, there's this feeling of returning back to center. And you'll notice that a lot today. As we inhale, we find expansion. As we exhale, everything draws back towards the center line of the body. So we'll continue with that theme, inhaling into this expansion. Maybe you feel the fingertips rise and spread just a little bit. And as you exhale, feel the fingertips draw ever so slightly closer together. Breathing in. Breathing out. Noticing that expansion on the inhalation. Noticing that release on the exhalation. When you're ready, we'll place the fingertips, the hands energetically or in real time on the low rib cage. As you inhale, feel the low ribs rise and spread. As you exhale, feel them draw closer towards the center line of the body. Breathing into this feeling of expansion. And breathing out, feeling this sensation of release in the body. It's like a conversation. As you inhale, feel the low ribs continue to rise. Maybe the fingertips expand just a bit. As you exhale, feel them draw closer together. Breathing into this feeling of expansion in the body. Breathing out this feeling of release. Inhales getting just a bit bigger. Exhale, returning towards the center line, knitting closer together. Breathing in and breathing out. When you feel comfortable and ready, begin to place the hands on the upper chest, that space just below your collarbones. As you inhale, feel the collarbones rise and spread. As you exhale, feel that subtle shift of them drawing just a bit closer together. Breathing in, feeling that expansion. Breathing out, feeling that gentle contraction, that shift, that coming together, coming home to yourself. Sometimes as we inhale, we're seeking a little bit of sensation outside of the body, it may feel like. And as we exhale, we draw that sensation back in. Maybe you internally begin to shift the gaze to something more external as you breathe in. And as you breathe out, start to shift the gaze more internally. Think of it as a conversation with yourself. Breathing into this expansion, breathing out contraction. Now, if you'd like, place one hand on your low belly and the other hand will remain on the upper chest. As you inhale, start to fill up the space in the low belly, the low rib cage, and then the upper chest. Big three-dimensional breath as you exhale, release the upper chest, the low ribs, the low belly. Breathing into that feeling of expansion from the bottom up. And as you exhale, feel that release from the top down. We'll take a few minutes to breathe in this way. I'll cue you through it for the first minute or so. And then I'll leave a couple moments for you to notice the sensation of three-dimensional breath in the body. Inhale, low ribs. 
Inhale, low belly rather, low ribs, upper chest. And exhale, upper chest, low ribs, low belly. Inhaling that feeling of expansion. Exhaling that feeling of contraction. Inhaling, filling up from the bottom up. And exhaling, releasing from the top down. Maybe you'd start to feel the sensation of the, the hand on the low belly rise. The low rib rises. And then the upper chest begins to rise. As you exhale, feel the upper chest release. The low ribs release. The low belly release. Start to notice these sensations in the body. Breathing in. And breathing out. Just tapping into the breath, inhaling here, and exhale. We'll take the next minute or so just to feel the sensation in the body. About 60 seconds, I'll give you just to be silent, just to feel what it feels like to breathe. And I'll bring us back into the room for a little meditation. If you've lost the three dimensionality to the breath, begin to invite that sensation back in. Inhaling from the bottom up. Exhaling from the top down. Breathing in. Breathing out. As you inhale, notice expansion. As you exhale, notice contraction, release. Now begin to return to a natural breath, a normal breath, something that feels more sustainable. You may increase the depth of the inhale. You may press out the exhale, adding some length. But start to come back into the room. Notice the sensations around you. Maybe you're hearing a little gentle buzz of air conditioner. Maybe you start to notice cars on the street going by. Just anything that brings you back into the room. Maybe it's noticing something in your surroundings, but we'll just begin to make our way back into this sensation, this felt sense of being in the room. We'll begin with a little bit of meditation. As we go through this meditation, you're welcome to keep the eyes closed if you'd like. Um, if it feels more present or grounding, keep them open, you're more than welcome to keep the eyes open. Like I said, we'll begin with a physical sense of something physical, we'll be juxtaposing to physical sensations. We'll get into more emotional sensations. We'll get into more mental sensations. And then we'll begin to close out our practice with more physical sensations, bring us back into the room. So begin in your comfortable seat, very gently. Start to manifest the sensation of heat in the body. Maybe you notice the toes feeling a little bit warmer. Maybe you feel the sensation of heat on the skin. Maybe you notice places where the clothing is touching your skin and you feel warmth or heat. And maybe you manifest an external sensation of heat, imagining a hot summer day, the sun beaming down on you, no shade. Noticing that heat in the body, breathing in and breathing out. Think of heat on the shoulders, the sun shining down on the shoulders. Think of heat on the top of the head, closest to the sun. Maybe the cheeks feel a little flush or pink. And as you're experiencing these sensations of heat in the body, begin to notice what it really feels like, the toll that it takes on you, that heaviness that weighs in. Maybe it's almost a sleepiness. We'll see how all of these sensations sort of relate to one another today that fatigue that happens in the sun. Maybe you feel the left thigh begin to feel a little bit warmer. The right thigh gets a little bit warmer. 
You feel the arms get just a bit warmer. And when you're ready, we'll release that sensation of heat entirely. Let all of it go. Let the idea of heat release from every single part of your body. And when you're ready, we'll start to envelop this idea of coolness in the body. We'll start to embody this idea, this sensation, this felt sense of cold in the body. Maybe the toes feel cold. Maybe you notice places where the skin is exposed on the body and you feel a little bit of air brushing over it. Notice the sensation of that feeling when you're outside in the winter and you don't have quite enough clothing on. Maybe you forgot your jacket. You feel that chill permeating down through the bone. A chill that doesn't go away instantaneously. It takes a little longer. Maybe you feel the nose start to get a little cold, or maybe you imagine the sensation of cold, coolness on the ears. Just begin gently to play around with the sensation of feeling cold, coolness. And when you're ready, we'll release this entirely, release the idea of cold throughout the entire body. And our goal through all of this is to return to a natural state. So as you release that, neither hot nor cold, come back to a sense of balance. Maybe you begin to feel neither hot nor cold, but content, balanced, just the right temperature. Those perfect days in the spring and the fall, we get so few of them here, but think about those perfect days where you walk outside and it feels just the same temperature as how you were inside. You don't need a jacket. You're just here existing in this perfect temperature. And then we'll begin gently to start noticing a sensation in the body of feeling awake. Feeling awake, maybe the eyes flutter open a little bit more, feeling energy coming through the body. As you feel awake, start to notice the sensation of the body waking up, feeling light and buoyant, lots of energy. Maybe you feel as if you could accomplish anything that you put your mind to. Maybe you feel just a little bit more alert. Could be mental. It could be more physical. As we begin to play with these sensations in the body, we can feel them in many different facets and aspects of our life. As you begin to notice the sensation of feeling awake, Begin to bring yourself into the ideas that being awake allows you to do. Things that you like to do when you're awake, the feelings that you get. Eventually we'll release that idea of feeling awake entirely. Release it from every part of your body. And now we'll start to begin to manifest the sensation of feeling asleep, tired, heavy, lethargic, beginning to slow down a little bit. The body feels heavy. The sensations in the body are slowing. As we begin to feel just a bit more tired, maybe we feel the eyelids begin to droop. As the body begins here, to take on the feeling of rest, that need of rest. Not just a want, not just laying back in bed after the alarm goes off, but really a need to sleep. Feel it through every part of your body. Maybe you start to feel tiredness through the eyelids. Maybe you start to feel the head feel a bit heavy. Maybe you feel fatigue in the legs or the feet. Knowing that you need a little bit more sleep. And when you're ready, we'll, we'll release the idea of sleepiness, of this tiredness from every part of the body. Every single part of the body returns to this natural balance, the state of neither awake nor asleep, just content, just being. We don't feel overly energized. We don't feel overly lethargic or tired. We're just in this moment of feeling like we're in perfect harmony and balance. And as you begin to release all of those sensations from the body, start to look at the feeling of joy. And as you start to feel joy radiating through the entire body, sometimes it can feel a little artificial at first. 
to invite us an emotion in without a precursing event, but start to as best as you can, as clearly as you can manifest it, feel the sensation of joy. Maybe it's when you first wake up on a Sunday morning and you have nothing to do, or maybe it's the feeling of hearing a baby laugh or the sensation of holding a puppy dog, whatever that sensation that has to, whatever the event that has to spark that sensation, just start to imagine it now. The feeling of joy radiates through the entire body. Maybe it starts with the face and begins to, you begin to smile just a little bit. Maybe with that sensation of joy, you begin to embody a felt sense of happiness, of that lightness, that freeness that comes along with feeling happy, that carefree attitude where you can just go about your day and nothing can phase you. And when you're ready, we'll begin to release the sensation of joy in the body. Release it from every part of your body. And that doesn't mean that the absence of joy means sadness. Our next sensation that we'll look at is actually contentment. And as you begin to bring in this idea of contentment into the body, think about how you can, without experiencing quite joy nor sadness, where is a place in the middle that we can find contentment? So maybe this contentment is feels like the lack of joy because we're neither ecstatic nor sad. We're just somewhere in the middle. And we'll start to experience that sensation in every part of the body. Maybe you feel a contentment through the face, a neutral face, emotions that aren't necessarily portraying happiness or sadness, more of a resting emotion. As you begin to notice the body feeling very neutral, maybe it's free of pain or neither super happy, not that radiating sensation. We're just coming somewhere more towards the middle. And then begin to release the sensation of contentment from the body, begin to notice how it feels just to come back to your natural resting state, wherever it is. And know that whatever emotions come up for you are entirely okay. Know that whatever emotions come up for you during this next one, it's completely okay to feel them. We'll give them the attention that they need. The last sensation that we'll play with, the juxtaposition will be between heaviness and lightness. So as you sit down, begin to notice a feeling of heaviness in the body. Maybe you notice the toes sinking into the ground or into the shoes that you're wearing. Maybe you feel the pinky toes start to get a little heavier. Maybe you feel your middle toes, the ring finger toes, the big toe. I never know what all the toes are called, but just notice the toes getting a little bit heavier. Notice the sensation of the heels rooting into the ground. Notice the sensation of your hips weighing into the mat, into the chair just a bit further. Maybe you feel the hip points get a little heavier, the legs, the thighs get heavier. Feel the right thigh heavy sinking into the ground or chair beneath you like stone. Heavy like stone, start to feel this heaviness in the right thigh, noticing how heavy the shoulders feel as you start to sit back in the chair. Maybe you sink in just a bit deeper. Maybe you notice the eyelids begin to close just a bit, feeling weighed down and heavy. Maybe you feel the body sinking just a little bit more, the spine rounds just a bit as we're sinking into the chair feeling that sensation of heaviness. Feel like you couldn't even lift your body if you tried. You just feel like you're in this space of feeling heavy. And when you're ready, we'll release the sensation of heaviness throughout the entire body. Release it from every single part of your body. And now we'll imagine the body feeling very light. The body begins to feel very, very light, like a little balloon, a helium balloon filling up. Feel the toes lift off the ground just a little bit. Start to feel the sensation of the heel releasing from the ground. Maybe you lift your heels just a bit. The left thigh feels just a bit lighter. The right thigh feels just a bit lighter. And as you begin to really embody the sensation of lightness, think of what else feels lighter in your body. Maybe the head feels a bit clearer. Maybe you feel the crown of the head draw up towards the ceiling just a bit more. As you notice the sensations of heaviness in the body versus lightness, how can we return to a sense of balance? Begin to release this idea of lightness in the body. 
from every single part of your body. Release it from the toes, the heels, the thighs, the crown of the head. And we'll begin to rebalance and come back into a space that feels more neutral, that feels more grounded, that feels more real life. Instead of feeling heavy or light, we're just starting to come back to the sensation of being in the room. The sensation of the natural state that is always available to you. You can always return to balance. It's right here for you. But sometimes it's a little hard when we swing into one side or the other. When we swing into these, uh, this idea of all or nothing, it can be hard to remember that we have balance right here for us. It's available anytime. So it's a tool that you can always use. And as we begin to close out our practice, we'll begin to look at one final sensation. And that is bliss. So instead of the joy that felt fleeting, think of bliss as more everlasting. Bliss is an emotion that doesn't leave, it lingers with us. Bliss isn't something that has to be an emotion that's felt. It's not energy traveling through the body. Think of it as a state of being. So we'll begin to imagine mentally, and maybe you start to embody it physically, this idea of bliss that doesn't leave. It's not artificial. Maybe it's more contentment for you. It's more the sensation of feeling like whatever happens, whatever comes in, we can always return to this natural state of balance. And maybe you call that bliss. Maybe you call it contentment, whatever feels most authentic to you. But we'll take the last few moments of this practice to be a bit more silent as you identify these feelings of contentment, of neutrality, these ideas of balance being restored to the body. I want to give the last few moments here time to really breathe with what's here. If that breath practice that we did towards the beginning resonated with you, maybe you start to notice the sensation of breath in the low belly, the low ribs, the upper chest, releasing from the upper chest, low ribs, low belly. But we'll take the last few moments just to be silent. And if the silence starts to feel uncomfortable, you're always welcome to bring attention back to the natural breath. Begin to bring your sensation back to the natural breath, a breath that feels sustainable, something that can carry you through your day. And as we start to reorient ourselves to the room, start to notice sensations around you arising. Maybe you notice the, some sounds around you. Maybe you begin to bring this idea of presence back into the body. When we play with opposite sensations in the body, it's easy to get swung into one or the other. So sometimes as we begin to embody these feelings, they don't always leave right away. So I invite you now to, re, to rebalance and come back to the sense of neutrality, back to the sense of contentment, just being in the room, sitting with what is, we don't have to pacify or we don't have to rather su suppress any emotions. We're just sitting with what is. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that, Sarah. Um, yeah, the manifestation sensations is just so interesting. I love, um, I loved all of that. That was really, that was really interesting. And I love that you, you mentioned the emotions that come up, you're okay, just to kind of hold space for them. So that was pretty great as well. Um, thank you again for sharing your beautiful words, Kathy, and this lovely meditation, Sarah. Um, thank you all for attending um, and spending some time with us today. Um, we just ask, please continue to think about Kathy's prompt and Sarah's breath work. Um, and again, thank you for your time and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you all.